Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Saul Griffith. The, if, uh, the if, if you need to change your, your program for a minute, you can, but I no, am. No, no, that's okay. You're right on time. So uh, we're just right where we are. We were about to put in a substitute uh, speaker for you, but, uh, but no problem. Uh, welcome, Saul Griffith, the uh, founder and chief scientist for Other Lab. Uh, an incubator for clean tech engineering and other other engineering projects, and the creator of Rewiring America, a nonprofit uh, dedicated to uh, the electrification of everything. So, uh, Saul, thank you for uh, for joining us. I'm glad you could be here and surprise me when I was uh, planning on uh, giving up your spot. So please uh, go ahead. Terrific. Um, and sorry, I am coming a little bit cold for strange circumstances how many minutes would you like uh, you've got uh, we've got a half an hour total uh, there's audience q a if you uh, leave a few minutes for that i'll pop back on and read a few questions until we run out of time my day job is starting tech companies uh mostly in the energy space solar wind some energy storage companies and some heating companies um but for the last few years i've been doing a lot of advocacy and policy work that started with rewiring America, which uh, had some part to do with the um, deployment of the Defense Production Act this week to make heat pumps, solar and other clean tech devices to help deal with the energy crisis and the gas crisis. So we're very proud of that work. We're also doing a project in rewiring Australia. Um, which I'm going to give you a talk that is talking about the public communications we are doing in Australia to make um, climate action move much faster and reorient climate policy to communities and what communities can do now for reasons that I'll hopefully show you quickly. Um, so that's by virtue of introduction to rewiring Australia, rewiring America. Um, we like to call rewiring Australia is an abundance agenda. Um, I think we're having a lot of communication. So a lot of this talk will actually be about communications. We're having communication set, uh, success, both with politicians. Uh, we use these communications to support what we're known as the teal independence in Australia. So they were a climate oriented independence uh, and the Greens party, which um, had an amazing performance in the most recent election and which is likely to change Australian politics forever and oriented towards climate and that abundance agenda is how we eliminate climate emissions, create jobs in our communities, revitalize community economics and save money for households. Um, unlike the US, uh, Australia has a very export oriented economy. This is a, a way of trying to reorient 30 years of a fear-based climate policy, which in Australia was very successful uh, at delay. And that was, um, we've got everything to lose. We're gonna lose our export industries. We're gonna lose um, jobs. Um, and this, this slide was critical in trying to reorient the, the near-term climate focus to the things that we have to win. So this is a breakdown of Australian emissions. I did it not according to the IPCC's categories, but rather categories of which do we export. So below the line, this is our coal and gas being exported. Above the line, there are domestic economy emissions, which are further breaking down into emissions in the domestic economy that serve domestic things, households, small businesses, um, you can see up here, and then trade emissions, which is energy used in the Australian economy that winds up as emissions elsewhere, for example, a huge amount of diesel is used on rail here, this red box, um, to move coal from mine to port. Uh, and that ultimately serves um, trade emissions, as does you know, roughly 60% roughly of our ruminants, our cows and our sheep are exported. So we also, Australia takes those emissions on us because they occur domestically, even though that meat is consumed overseas. You'll see these three colours here. I think this is critical. Green is the things we can do today that we have technology that you can buy on the shelf for. That's electric vehicles, that's heat pumps, that's rooftop solar. Orange are things under development. That's green steel, that's green ammonia. You can't go out and buy a, a plant yet at scale. Um, and then red are emissions that can only be eliminated when we eliminate our fossil fuel industry and exports. The reason I show those, um, 
priorities is to put those priorities in terms of the IPCC illustrative emission pathways for one and a half degrees. Um, most of you will sort of, if you've read in the details, P1 and P2 are what they call low overshoot. So they just go into relatively small amounts of negative emissions. P3 and P4 are 10 to 20 gigatons of negative emissions. That's that they are literally imagining we build an industry twice as large as all fossil fuel industries today to put that massive, you know, bury that massive carbon somewhere. Um, that's a little bit extraordinary. So I think we're more advised on the, stay on the P1 and P2. And then you'll remember that I had those <clears throat> green, orange and red color codes. This is really so we can emphasize for policymakers and people what they can do. The green stuff, what we can do today, end use electrification, electrify everything, um, deploy renewables, nuclear, that hopefully buys us enough time for the harder to abate sectors, air travel, beef, agriculture, steel, which are a great concern in a country that's export oriented. And the reason to show that priority is we can actually now show uh, a community in the context of that emission trajectory. Um, these are, when I say community, I'm now talking actual households, actual small businesses, um, really, we have 20 years to eliminate those emissions, and then we can illustrate and highlight what's difficult about that um, is that you have to think about the machines underneath. So through a lot of work I've done modeling energy systems, it's really about understanding the machines underneath. Water heaters last on average 10 or 12 years, kitchen appliances that run on gas 12 to 15, space heaters 15 years, cars 20 years. So these curves in blue, green, and purple are literally the 100% adoption curves of those technologies, meaning if we make sure that every single time one of those machines is retired, they are replaced with an electric demand side machine. That's the only way we're really gonna stay on target for those climate emissions. Um, further thinking about the machines is useful. Uh, Maybe, maybe useful to this group, when talking to real communities and real humans, not PhDs and scientists about this transition, the thing they most misunderstand is the timeline. So they might hear everything I've just said and then feel guilty that they haven't yet bought the electric vehicle, haven't yet bought a heat pump. But one audience member came to me and I thought this was fabulous. Uh, a year ago, his family pledged net zero 2025. They made a plan. Rooftop solar in Australia is 95 cents a watt US before government subsidy, 61 cents US per watt installed after government subsidy. That means it's three to five cents per kilowatt hour delivered electricity at your home. So that's so cheap that he says, well, I'm going to get solar first, then I'm going to electrify the stove and the water heating over the next two years because they'll save money. That's when they anticipate the prices of batteries will have dropped sufficiently to make it competitive. 2024, they're waiting for the electric vehicle to come to them in 2025. This might be a useful thing for an American or an international audience. Australia has no emission standards on vehicles, unlike California. So we were deprioritized by the world's automotive companies for electric vehicles. Uh, so America and Asia was going to get them first. Europe has now stepped in with very bold zero emission standards for vehicles. And so all of the Euro manuf European manufacturers are now prioritizing Europe. So the big challenge for Australia is even if you want an electric car, it probably has a 12 or 18 month uh, waiting period and they and we're still waiting for the ones that Australians want. Anyway, I thought that was interesting because in essence, you can now think of every household and I think it's good to think about the purchasing decisions that have to be made to solve climate change. And every household might be making, uh, it's really a step function. And this is to emphasize that, uh, you know, at street level, um, it's about the infrastructure of people's lives. If they make these seven decisions, you know, is their car electric? Do they have rooftop solar? Are they purchasing green electricity? Are they put, you know, is, do they have a heat pump or electric water heater, induction or electric cooking? Do they have a battery? Um, and what is heating their home? You can imagine that they can make those step function choices over time. 
if we're supporting every household with policy, with finance, um, we can actually imagine that the collection of households is on target to actually hit those emissions targets that we need to hit. Um, that, that has been successful in Australia um, for a few reasons, but mostly because it's economic. So we know that actually, and this number is the same in the US, 42% of emissions in the US or in the Australian domestic economy are decisions made around the kitchen table. Exactly that same set of decisions. What fuels the cars? What heats the home? Where does the electricity come from? How are fuels are made? And if you include the commercial sector, which is small businesses and malls and restaurants and retail, it's actually about 65% and it's the similar set of technologies uh, that are the answer. They also have th th you know, low temperature thermal loads, they have cooking loads and they have vehicles. So in fact, the majority of our near-term emissions have technologies that can address them um, and we can talk about them at retail. So in Australia, we're running a program to achieve zero emissions by electrifying the demand side machines and supply clean electricity and putting the priority there at number one on demand side electrification is an, I can't underscore how significant that is as a change in climate policy emphasis. And I think we're seeing that same change in climate policy emphasis happen in the US and the bills that are passing are more likely to be around demand side electrification than uh, supply side measures. Electrify the demand side machines. Again, this is the cartoon version. It's a small number of decisions made over a decade. You know, everyone is going to buy these machines in the next 20 years anyway. How do you get them to buy the right machines? Uh, 1.8 or 1.9 vehicles per household, the, whole, the heating systems, the cooking systems, and whether they do solar or battery. Um, this won't be news to anyone here, but it's worth just emphasizing it's a fun cartoon. Um, this electron, electrification will cut energy use by more than half, improves health, quality of life, lowers energy bills. How is that true? We've been pursuing an efficiency approach to energy for 50 years because efficiency conceivably could have solved the 1970s energy crisis. Efficiency can't get us to zero emissions. So here's the, the, the gasoline F-150 on the left. 80% of the energy is wasted as heat. We've had 50 years trying to make it that middle bar slightly more efficient, but the F-150 Lightning is actually two thirds less energy per mile. Same with heat pump water heaters, one third the energy of, of gas, uh, skip the efficiency programs in the middle that are, you know, there's only a one or 2% more to be gleaned out of the efficiency of gas heaters. Uh, same for space heaters, even with cooking, electric cooking now has been shown to be about twice as efficient as gas. Um, and then, of course, one of the biggest wastes of energy is the thermoelectric losses for generation on the left there. Again, we've been applying efficiency to that problem, but now we know that clean electrification is the standard. Um, this chart, I could show it for, for the US or for Australia. It's very, very similar. Um, total energy use goes down. So this, the average Australian household left 100 kilowatt hours per day. Uh, that's diesel. Uh, and gasoline in gray, natural gas, a little bit of wood heat in green, but natural gas in purple in the middle. Blue is the electricity currently delivered to the household. Orange is the thermoelectric losses generating that electricity. So the average Australian household fully electrified will go from 13 or 14 kilowatt hours a day to 37. Um, so electricity goes up about 250% energy use goes down by more than half. That's the extraordinary efficiency of electrification, um, which is the efficiency we we sort of missed uh, for 50 years. The biggest news story is around the economics of this transition. Many of you might wonder why I left the US to move to Australia. Partly it is because the economics of this transition works in Australia before the US very significantly uh, because of the rooftop solar, um, that rooftop solar at three to five cents per kilowatt hour. Think about that. Even if you could produce electricity for free on the US grid, the average cost of transmission and distribution to the household is around eight cents. Um, in California, it's about 
sort of getting the, you know, I sell solar to the PG&E for two or three cents a kilowatt hour from industrial facilities that we uh, participate in building. I purchased that back in San Francisco for 23 cents a kilowatt hour and about 15 cents is transmission and distribution costs. So rooftop solar, actually, you can sort of now predict once you achieve the Australian cost structure, we can talk about why later in questions if people are interested, why does it cost under a dollar in Australia and over $3 in the US. Um, but once you achieve that under a dollar of what rooftop solar is, the cheapest electricity that man, you know, real humans have ever experienced. This is the average Australian household today, $80,000 in expenditures, $5,000 a year on energy. It will be seven and a half or $8,000 a year this year because of the rising cost of gasoline and gas. Um, it's similar ratio as it is in the US. All of you, I don't need to show you this. This is Swanson's curve. This is the learning by doing rate of um, solar. Costs are still coming down. We know these learning curves for solar, wind, batteries, EVs. And you can also look at the total amount that we need to install to get the world to zero of all these things. And we need to more than you, you know, we need more than 10 and as much as 20 times the production rates that we currently have for all of these technologies. And interestingly, that shows you that the prices of all of them are already falling greatly, but they're going to fall by more than half, kind of just as the function of getting to scale for solving climate change. With some more subtlety, we can actually build that into an economic model for households. So this um, I first did this study under rewiring America for the US. We called it the, the household study. Uh, and we could show that um, Americans on average would be breaking even uh, in about 2027, 20, 2028 for all energy costs um, once the rooftop solar and the other components got to the right scale. We redid those numbers for Australia. This is what they look like again. 2021, about $5,200 a year. We're predicting around $7,000 a year in 2022. If you went out and you could buy 1.8 electric vehicles and the electric um, heat pump, hot water heater, stove, et cetera, the majority of your energy costs will actually now be in financing that capital cost. So that gray bar is the, 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 the finance cost, 794 for or the pink money at the bottom is the amount of electricity that Australian households would be um, collecting from the grid. The majority of Australian households, over 80%, are single family standalone. Embarrassingly, we have larger per square, larger square footage per household than Americans. Uh, we broke past that record about five years ago. So we have very large rooftops in a very mild climate with excellent solar. Two thirds or three quarters of energy can be generated on the on the household. So that little pink bit at the bottom is the remaining electricity. But the bigger point here is the hardware costs are falling very quickly, and you can now see that 2024 or 2025 is the crossover point for the economics for the Australian household being in favour of of total household electrification. Our constraint now is not economic. The two constraints are supply chain, so access to electric vehicles, and the other very critical to mention challenge for Australian households, because it's also true for American households, is access to credit. So for the top five or so percent of households, they can pay cash and afford to do this. For the 50% in the middle, or the next 50%, they will likely finance these capital purchases against their homes or mortgages. Um, but the challenge is credit access all the way to the bottom because you need to do 100% of households. So that, that emphasizes that we'll have a, that problem. Extraordinarily, by 2030, um, Australian households will be saving three to $5,000 a year on their uh, average cost of energy for everything they do in their house. Um, can I just have a time check? You, you've got about uh, 10 minutes left total. So Terrific. Um, a little less than that. So because we have um, 
we're very interested in running pilot communities to demonstrate that this is uh, a big component of our climate solution. What is the demonstration necessary for? Most uh, distribution companies, utilities, uh, are balking at the amount of solar that is now coming into the grid, and that's causing line voltage and line phase matching issues uh, in Australia and in the US. We would like to technically prove that that is no longer a problem at the suburb level uh, and prove out the economics. So in Australia, we're now discussing as many as 10 total suburban pilots of complete um, decarbonisation and electrification. I happen to live in a prototypical Australian suburb with that thousand households. It's in a prototypical zip code. We call them postcodes, 2515. It also happens to be prototypical in that it is four and a half thousand households under one zone substation, the Wanbara zone substation. That zone substation in an extremely typical globally sense, there's about five strings from that substation. It's serving uh, about a thousand households per string. So we are looking at running now in multiple locations in Australia, actual total electrification on one string under a zone substation to be the final technical proof and then the economic proof that this is our best pathway to early emissions. Jumping very quickly through a few slides, this is the existing power trace for one Boris zone substation through the year. This is the temperature trace on top. We can build these similarly in the US, these models. Um, you can actually see you know, hot day events in our December, our summer and February, air conditioning spikes, cold day events in our, our winter. Causing those spikes, um, you remember, however, we have, a, we have models for electrification. We can use that model of electrification to now predict that we'll go from this, this black line to actually this red line. Um, the majority of the increase is the two electric vehicles per household. Uh, we'll go to about eight megawatts um, as the winter load and six megawatts in the summer load. What's very interesting about that is how much it lowers the variation. Whereas you have a 200% swing from two to four megawatts today, because the electric vehicles iron out the um, the seasonal variation, you, you only actually have 25% variation and that significantly helps. If you take our suburb, sorry, the print's a little small, um, our, our, our zip code, you can actually, um, we've got models built here that with good penetration of reasonable rooftop solar, um, this zip code can actually produce about 25% more energy than it needs uh, throughout the year. If you then look at that over that trace, uh, instead of, you know, with 100% rooftop solar penetration, and we're talking eight to 10 kilowatt systems that will fit on the great majority of roofs here, uh, we would be over production for a huge portion of the year and slightly under production in the margins. <coughs> Part of the idea of using this abundance agenda is to help people understand that once you get rooftop solar, this is really important to 95 cents a watt installed or three to five cents a kilowatt hour. Building over capacity and designing your systems for winter makes total economic sense when you're competing against grid priced electricity at 20 to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So having 150 or 200% of the capacity you need is still an economic win over traditional grid electricity in Australia. Um, just to finish and then go to questions, um, what excites me a lot about this is thinking about the economic transition this means for communities. We launched Rewiring America, an event in Washington uh, in 2021. And I think it was Senator Martin Heinrich of New Mexico stood up and very significantly said, this is, we're about to witness the greatest wealth transfer in history from the traditional supplier of energy to the traditional consumer of energy. And I think that's true in this graphic or series of graphics tries to capture that. 
this is an average home today, and this could be just as true in California or New Mexico or Carolina as it is in Australia. That household spends $3,400 a year on, on oil. That money leaves the zip code only creating half a job at the local gas station, which really that job is serving um, corn syrup and tobacco as much as it is selling oil. <sighs> Three hundred odd dollars a year leaves to go on natural gas, and then a thousand dollars a year goes to purchase grid electricity. A little bit of money is spent on labour in the local community, and a little bit of money is saved on the current small portion of smaller solar systems. You can imagine this is when we completely electrify the household. We're not purchasing that oil. That money is the majority of that money is now being spent locally. We're not purchasing that gas. Um, we are still buying electricity, but we're buying uh, green electricity from the grid. But actually, the, the households on total cost of vehicle ownership and cost of energy saved in the house, so our household will be saving about $4,300 um, or actually about $5,000 a year. But it will result in about $5,600 a year in community spending, including every household's extra installation costs going to local labor. It'll create about five local jobs um, and uh, about 55 percent and the same ratio in it's true in America as in Australia about 55 percent of household spending gets spent in the local community so thinking about it as a community um, our our zip code 15 million dollars a year gets spent on uh, oil and gas another four million on grid electricity but what could be happening in 2030 if you scale this up to all the households um, is they'd still be spending about four million on grid electricity. They'd be spending a million and a half dollars on local electrification labor, creating 25 jobs and using those that 55% ratio of community spending, saving 20 odd million in the community um, that would create 400 general economy jobs in cafes and libraries and school teachers. So. I think it's as to end on an optimistic note. Um, I think the, the most beautiful thing that we can now imagine is if we uh, if we really apply the pressure on the electrification of our vehicles, the electrification of our heat and making the majority of that run on rooftop and community solar. Um, we have an enormous opportunity for economic renewal of communities. That is just as true in North America as it is in Australia. Australia for ba basically the fundamental reason that we've already achieved rooftop solar at a dollar a watt gets to get there first. Hopefully we can get that regulatory win in the US soon um, so that the US can also be following this uh, pathway for the double win of of in improving economics of real communities and uh hitting our emissions targets uh in the near term so maybe with there i can go to questions great thank you uh so much saul we're uh we're we're right up against time so i since you seeded it i'm going to ask one question which is uh why is it so much cheaper to install rooftop solar in australia than it is in the us if you can answer that in one one minute that'd be uh, that'd be awesome. Um, it's actually quite complicated and some of it is luck. Uh -huh. uh, there was New York Times op-ed last week where I answered some of that. To put it simply, um, we made permitting an over the phone smart app so you can get the permit on the same day that you buy it. And in fact, if you speak to a solar installer, you can order it one day and it'll be installed the following day. In the US, that typically has a three to nine month delay to go through permitting. About 50% of people pull out from the purchase. So that's part of the origin of the story. The other origin of the story is Australia did a federal certification and training program. So we trained the installers, we certified them nationally, we moved some of the liability away from the contractor to the government by virtue of that. Um, and that lowered the overhead costs of the contractor. And it also um, critically turned the contractor into the inspectors. So those two components also with um, generous last decade rebates and subsidies that are now being phased out because it's economic on the numbers are, are really the main reasons for 
you know, the quite extraordinary difference between on average Australia under $1 a watt and in the US 280 to 320 a watt. Great. Thank you so much, Saul. I'm so glad that you were able to join us despite the uh, technical <laughs> challenges. And, uh, and uh, thank you for zooming in from across the Pacific. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ron.